Welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge. I know that you're here because you want to master your animal training skills using a force-free approach. And to handle the variety of challenges you face, you need a broad knowledge and experience base. The problem is we all get stuck and hit rough patches in our training, which can leave us feeling overwhelmed and helpless. Our mission since 2015 is to empower trainers just like you. The Animal Training Academy has helped thousands of trainers globally to develop skills, gain confidence, and positively influence both animal and human learners. Here's how we can do the same for you. Sign up for our membership waitlist at www.atamember.com. Register when our doors open, email arrives, and start growing your training skills. Build impactful training practices, benefiting you and those you train. So join the waitlist at www.atamember.com. And while waiting, enjoy this free podcast show. We want to see you avoid embarrassment, overwhelm, and burnout. Instead, We want to see you build resilience to setbacks, get more organized, and grow your training skills and knowledge. In short, we want to see you enjoy confidence in yourself as a trainer and lead a fulfilling life, positively impacting the lives of the animal and human learners you work with. But we will start today's episode where I'm thrilled to welcome back to the show one of my favorite human beings, Ava Bertelson. Ava holds a master's degree in behavior analysis and embarked on her educational and behavior journey in 1994 at a local dog club. Her early exposure to science-based animal-friendly training methods fueled her passion, leading to a versatile career as a teacher, coach, and mentor. In 1998, Ava co-founded Carpe Momentum with Emily Johnson Vey, focusing on innovative training techniques and co-authoring the book, Agility Right From The Start. Their collaboration also extends to Clicker Expo and Tag Teach roles, pioneering approaches like seamless sessions and start button behaviors. Ava consults for animal care facilities, aiding veterinary and grooming professionals in cooperative care, and mentors, trainers, and behavior analysts. In Sweden, Ava runs a membership group for husbandry training, teaches tag teach workshops, organizes major animal training conferences, and hosts international speakers. Her role in the Swedish Association for Behavior Analysis further cements her impact in advancing animal training and behavior analysis, benefiting both animal and human learners globally. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Ava Bertelsen back to the show today, who's patiently waiting by in Sweden. Ava, thank you so much for taking the time to come and hang out with us again at Animal Training Academy. Oh, thank you so much, Ryan. It is, as always, a pleasure to get the opportunity to talk to you. And exciting that this year, 2024, after discussing it for what seems like a long time, literally three to four years now, thanks, COVID, we, being myself and the awesome Sophie Bell from Positive Behaviour here in Wellington, New Zealand, and in collaboration with Lisa Wright from the Canine Education Academy in New South Wales, Australia, will be bringing Ava Bertelsen, that's you, to Australasia. How pumped are you about that? Oh, it's like, it's the only thing that seems to be on my agenda at the moment for 2024. <laughs> Whenever somebody asks me now during Christmas holiday, like, okay, so what are you doing in 2024? I'm like, I am going to New Zealand and Australia and it's in November. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, maybe I'm doing some things before that as well. But it's it's literally the, f- the first thing that pops to mind. I am. Oh, I'm so excited about this trip. So when you come here, I'm excited because you're going to be talking about and conducting workshops with both theory and hands-on aspects in cooperative care. This is, well, I'm excited because I've, I've never been to an event specifically focused on cooperative care in this region, especially with someone as skilled and knowledgeable as you, Ava. 
I'm thrilled that we're doing this, like you said, in November and December. And we're going to talk more about that later and how you, the listener, can get involved. But for now, in today's episode, we want to show you the awesomeness you can access if you're in Australasia and want to attend these events by talking with Ava today about cooperative care and her work in this space. Now, before we dive in, I realize that the majority of you who listen to this show are intermediate to advanced trainers. And when I mention cooperative care, you know what I mean. But you might be a listener who is relatively new to training, which is awesome, and you are so welcome here. You're definitely in the right place. Please listen to all of our episodes. And if you're not quite sure what I mean by cooperative care, here is a definition. Cooperative care in animal training refers to the practice of training animals to willingly and actively participate in their own care, such as grooming, veterinary procedures, and daily handling. This approach emphasizes the use of positive reinforcement and consent, allowing the animal to have a choice and control over the process. The goal is to create a stress-free and enjoyable experience for both the animal and the human learner involved, fostering trust and improving overall welfare. Ava, would you like to add anything to that definition? I think it's a beautiful definition. And I think that our focus on the interaction between the the animal and the human and the animal and its environment in these situations where we as humans need know that there are some things that are needed in the animal's best interest, but the animal doesn't know that. So we we can foresee that we need to do this procedure for your your health benefits, and it will be it's it's like cooperative care would be our way to make that and actually whenever possible, enriching experience and fun training engagement. And when we can't make it fun and enrichment, at least minimize the stress involved and the distress involved. Perfect. Let's dive in and talk about this for the next hour. So buckle in. And before we do, I just would love to know, Ava, because we talked about some dates there, 1994, 1998. Uh, So we're going back a good, nearly 2024. We can say 30 years now. 30 years now. Oh, my God. Could you start with us? Yeah, oh, my God. How's that feel? Oh, my God. I'm like, yeah, I... I've been training, I've been in dog training since 1993 now. It's crazy. So who's counting anyway? <laughs> but but, but it, it does put things in pers- into perspective. And for me, it puts p- things into perspective when it comes to the area of, of cooperative care, of training for veterinary procedures, of training for just the everyday life situation of putting on a collar or or wiping paws or whatever it is that we need to do sort of to our animals that we would, that we can now rather do with our animals. And I know that I was a pretty darn good trainer for other things way before. I was an even decent trainer for this type of scenarios. Like I was, I started out with trick training, obedience training, um, agility training, because these were things that I could uh, understand how to do. I could figure out how to do them positive reinforcement. I could use them to build relationships and have a fun time with my, my dogs at the time. And I would do the best I could under the conditions that I had to extend that also to um, things that had to do with care. But I can see in retrospect that my skill levels were really low in how to create um, stress-free care situations compared to my skill levels using positive reinforcement uh, for Get, getting those obedience uh, championship titles and the high level agility competition and so on. So it took me a, it took me a long time. It's, I would say it's since like my my full focus has been on cooperative care. I would say since 2017. Before that, there was a period of maybe 10 years of 
just beginning to learn as much as I could and doing a lot of training with my own animals. And just, it's it's just, it's such a cool topic and it's so, so fascinating. There's so many things that we can, that we can do. Yeah, just love it. Love every bit of this. And so back in 2000, sorry, 2000, it's even hard to say back in 1993, back in 1993 uh, or 94, was the term cooperative care part of your vocabulary? Had that even, had no. When did that, when in your journey, was it 2017? Or was that just when you started to put your primary focus on cooperative care? 2017 was when I decided like, this is going to be my primary focus professionally. Um, before that, like the 10 years before that, would it would be more of a private passion together with Tesla, my body collie, of, okay, we, we need to really dig into how to work with this. But it's a good question. When did these terms start to come up? In Swedish, we'd call it voluntary handling. I'm guessing, like I would, I would have seen really good, great training uh, coming from the, primarily from the zoo training community from maybe the early 2000s or so. But the trans, for me, the translation of that into my own training still took time and it took time for me to make it a, a real priority also compared to all the other things I was doing. But it's like, it's a it's a, it's an awesome question. I don't have an answer. I would guess sometime between, sometime around 2010, maybe that the term cooperative care would come up. The practice was around before that, but I guess I I have no idea. Is the the honest answer? I am now super curious to all the listeners of what terms have you heard? What terms have you been using, and when did they come about? Hmm. Need a little bit of a, a history and cooperative care training, yeah, and how that evolved, like you said, from the zoo industry into to, to other areas, the dog training, horse training, whatever species you're working with, yeah, because it's such a big difference between knowing that something is there and starting to dabble in it a little bit, and really diving into okay, this is now a primary, this is a primary focus. This is something we can actually do. So, so the listeners of the show you might not know. Uh, I mentioned it briefly in your bio. You're with the um, cherished Emily Johnson Vay wrote a book, Agility, right from the start, which Karen Pryor asked you to write. So you've got this name, you've got this book, you've you've got this presence at Clicker Expo, you've got this space, but your reinforcers were elsewhere. Not necessarily. That might not be the correct way to word it, but you chose to to focus primarily on cooperative care. So, what what is so reinforcing for you about cooperative care versus all of these other areas which are highly skilled, highly recognised, highly appreciated for, and already had a career built up in that space? We, what were the reinforcers for you over in cooperative care that pulled your entire focus over to that? So, partly. It would be the practical work with a variety of species. Like, I I, I spent uh, I, I spent a lot of time back in 2010, 2011, 2012 in zoological environment, and then working practically with cooperative care procedures. And I had Tisla, my border collie, where cooperative care was something that we were working on a lot, but that wasn't necessarily easy. So I'll, I'll tell you more about, um, I think we'll di- dive more into our nail trimming story a bit later. But she she was definitely like living with her meant uh, that, that I got a lot of opportunity to practice a lot of everyday life things, including cooperative care procedures. So... So, so that was part of it. And then part of it also being here is this, here is this exciting area that I see others being, others doing and being really great at and that I haven't learned enough about yet. So it's sort of, you, you, you see this, this wow thing that I just want to learn more about. 
And I guess it also, so it came together with working more with other species and like working, do, doing these procedures, building that, that type of behavior. It came together with having Tesla at home. It came together with um, the competition setting not being as... Uh, appealing to me for a variety of, of reasons anymore. So I was just um, not getting, I was like, it wasn't the primary focus of my life. Where can we, how can I go socialize on the next agility competition? Uh, I had done that for so many, so many, such, such a long time already. And it was like time to do other things. And it's such a, it's such a training challenge that it fit very well uh, with, just the the need for continued development, and also of course it fit. I mean, it fits perfectly with um, the the work that I've done done for such a long time in other venues, like working with scary things, working with scary things on the agility field, working with scary things in everyday life, teaching like what Karen Pryor. Uh, got hooked by uh, our work with the teeter training and how to how to work with animals uh, being in total control over uh, potentially scary things like, like noises and movement. It's like I had a lot of background in working with scary or uncomfortable stuff and making that into an enriching part of the training. So that that, that surely also was part of what what uh what made the cooperative care area super reinforcing for me to to dig into awesome and so working with scary things for a long time delving into changing your primary focus into cooperative care in 2017 and working across a large variety of different species which makes me excited to hear your perspective on the next question i wanted to ask you and that is, what do you think are the biggest challenges? Let's say three, but you don't have to limit it to three. You can do more, you can do less. What, what are the three biggest challenges do you think that trainers face that you see uh, with all of the workshops you do and, and all of the different species you work with and all of the individual trainers that you work with? What are some of the main challenges that trainers face with cooperative care and, and how to overcome these challenges? So the first one that I come to think of would be the training goals. And this comes also from a personal level of uh, coming from areas of training where the goal, the outcome is pretty straightforward. While with my cooperative care training, with our cooperative care training, the goals, the behavioral goals are so multifaceted. And I think finding, like figuring out what should be my primary focus? How can I keep my focus on many different things at once? So it's not just about the animal coming over to me standing still so that I can do this eye drop or whatever it is. It's, it's, it's also how is um, do, do we have relaxation in behavior? Do we have a vari like a variation in behavior? How are we negotiating the whole uh, the whole setting around it? What should be my criterion right now? How do I move through my criteria in my training session? There is a lot of more. I find I have there that it's a more challenging decision making when it comes to small training goals and criteria. That, that's definitely one challenge that has to do with animal training directly. Right, and I, and I feel that as you say that, m my mind is thinking that is challenges that more intermediate and advanced trainers face because they've built that skill set of firstly understanding what criteria are and how to, how to move between them and understanding how what relaxed means for different individuals, for different species. Uh, would, would you say that, that that challenge is the same challenge for people who are, because bear with me, listeners of the show, as I cut myself off half sentence to start another sentence, <laughs> would, you, <laughs> would you say that that's the same for trainers who maybe started training around 2017, who are seeing you and other people share cooperative care training videos on social media 
um, and they, like you, also can appreciate and like you shared with the listeners of the show you were also experiencing in your career, uh, would you say they're the same challenges? You know, from my experience in in workshops and online uh, sharing and uh, working with clients, yes, if we, like whether it is a uh, just regular caregiver who has no interest or previous background in in training or not, knowing what to look for. What are we trying to achieve? What are we looking for in this animal that is beyond them just being still so that we can do things to them? Yeah, I still think that is the the number one challenge and a, a very high goal for our teaching. And then I think that goes on to like if I'm going to say three challenges, and that would be the first one. The second one would be handling ourselves in this. And that will also be like, I think that comes instantly for many people as they step into the world of the possibility of, wow, we can do these the things cooperatively. Uh, it is possible to teach my dog to enjoy the nail trims then it becomes a challenge for oneself instantly in, can I really do that? How can I do that? Do I feel now shame for what I have done before? Um, but I don't, I don't have the skills. I don't have the time. What when I have to do something? How do I do that? Do you mean that I must never force my animal to do everything? It's like it opens this can of worms that goes to ourselves which would be the second big challenge. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's I think it's the main challenge because I mean it bleeds into all areas of training and this term that uh, is reinforcing to use and that is imposter syndrome uh, and the comparison of our own thoughts about ourselves and expectations versus uh, I'm catching myself here because I'm making sure that I get this right. <laughs> How how often do you actually describe imposter syndrome? So imposter syndrome being that I think my skill set is below what I'm actually capable of. And that for me falls into what you're saying here. Can I really do this? Do I really have this skill set? Am I good enough to be a cooperative care trainer? Because I've done all these bad things uh, and I can't trim my dog's nails now. But I know that my dog's nails need trimming. But I call myself a cooperative care trainer. What am I going to do? Like I, that's a huge problem, and I know that many of you listening to the show experience those feelings, um, as as have I. What what do you have to say to the listeners in terms of what to do if you're sitting there going, "Oh my God, that's me," as as we all are, because we all have things that we have to do with our animals from time to time, even not in the present, that they're not trained for. Yeah, and it's the same. It is the same discussion, sort of, isn't it? I, as in the aspiration to do the best for our animals, the aspirations to be maybe uh, primarily positive reinforcement training, maybe really animal welfare centric, uh, like it it comes into the same uh, into the same area. And I think being kind to ourselves and acknowledging that wow, even having those thoughts means that I have taken a a step into something that is sort of beyond where I've been before, which is really cool. I am not going to be doing worse things to my animal companion through being aware that I am sorry, I'm going, I'm I'm sorry, I'm hurting you right now, or I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not doing what might be the best for you right now, but I'm doing the best, I'm doing the best that I can right now, given all the conditions that I'm in, like acknowledging that we are also living, learning beings and not, not end up sort of hurting ourselves in the, this aspiration to not hurt our animals because then, then we have an animal hurting anyway. And then like practically just talking about that I find it like in my membership group I do find it it seems like that really helps of just constantly again and again going it's okay 
it's it's fine. It's fine to do differently. It's fine that I have this day now and you had that day yesterday. And my aspiration for this year is this. And your aspiration might be something completely different. It's all fine. It's all it's all building together anyway. And if you're the listener of the show, maybe you're thinking that it's overwhelming because you struggle to do what Ava just said. <laughs> is to be kind to yourself and to acknowledge yourself as a learner and all of that stuff. And so we're definitely not trying to say that this stuff is easy. It takes time, but I think some great advice there. Um, What is the third thing that came to your mind when I asked that original question? The third challenge, I think, is being with and working with or just dealing with other human beings, which, like I can see for me personally, that wasn't that wasn't a challenge when I was in the competition setting as much. I could do my own thing. I could train my animals uh, to do fun things together with me, and we could have support of other people. And there might be, I don't know, conflict sometime. But it was like I could be with my animal, and we could be doing our things. We could be in our bubble. While when I'm working with veterinary procedures or procedures for the groomer or for hoof trims for the horses or like whatever it is. A lot of the work with corporative care involves directly other people too, in a way that a lot of my other training doesn't. And I think the awareness of that and like acknowledging that that's not always so easy, uh, yeah, that, that that I would say is is the third the third challenge of just figuring out how to best work, and also it comes to both um, the other person and my animal together with me and the other person and myself together with the other person because like at least for me personally my learning history of going to the vet with my animal or being in situations where somebody else needs to do something with my animal. I have some aversive avoidant behavior learning history in there where I'm like, I don't know how to, what I can do best here. And I sort of just go, I'm I'm just going to try to avoid the whole situation and sort of not not say so much and feel uncomfortable about it. And I think a lot of people have that. And that goes, of course, from the professional side as well. And this is something that we're working on a lot of how can the professionals, the vet, the groomer, the physiotherapist, whatever, uh, get the best communication with and like a positive reinforcement experience with me, us as caregivers, and vice versa. Yeah, the people aspect is another obviously big challenge that bleeds into many different areas. But as you say, is particularly relevant for cooperative care. And I think possibly another episode or a couple of episodes <laughs> there to talk about how to improve communication and, and build on that. I'm, I'm curious, we talked briefly there about that feeling of guilt or blame if you're administering some need to your animal in terms of trimming its nails or putting on its harness or taking it to the vet. Uh, And there is some reluctance or fear, but we all find ourselves in positions where our animals need some level of care. And we're in the context where we either haven't trained for that or we're not skilled enough to help that animal at that time, but we need to administer some veterinary procedure, grooming procedure, basic husbandry procedure. How do, how, do, how do we balance the need for care with our identification as cooperative care trainers and an animal's reluctance or fear? How do we, how do we balance all of those things? So I would, I have to just take a, a, a slight detail first and say, I've never thought of identifying myself as a cooperative care trainer. It's like it's a it's it's a new oh that's something you could actually identify as of course of, of course it could be just as you could identify as primarily positive reinforcement or or whatever but but I think this is like this is a challenge that everybody faces like 
the, and this is one of the cool things I think about cooperative care or about working with helping people with veterinary and uh, and husbandry procedures. One of the first um, first lectures I had in Sweden a few years back that was focused totally on on cooperative care was for a local working dog club association with quite a few quite traditional trainers in it and it, not only not having them, them not having uh, experience with positive reinforcement procedures really for uh, for veterinary procedures but also doing quite mixed training in other venues of their life but i mean they have the same as me in i don't want my dog to suffer when we're at the vet I feel bad when I put my dog through a procedure where I see they are stressed. So that that seems to be, I, I, I truly believe that is like across the board. Everybody finds this challenge of, I am sorry, I need to do this now. And I can see that this is painful or stressful for you. So I think that's really a global thing. Uh, regardless of how we train. And that also means that how to negotiate that is it, it needs sort of a lot of global solutions, I guess. So how, how can we do that in the best way? If I look at what is my most common advice just practically, that seems to be helpful for a lot, uh, is to just separate procedures. Like... Give, give clear warning, don't trick your animal so that they at least don't have to worry the rest of the time. If we're gonna do something that is uh, aversive to them, let them know that that is gonna happen so that the stimulus control doesn't spread to a lot of other situations. And it doesn't matter if it's uh, at the vet or my nail trim or lifting you in the car when you are avoiding the car. Like for all those scenarios where we shift into something aversive will happen now and there is no real way for you to avoid it, to just have clear stimulus control for that. That seems to be something that is helpful, both for the animal, but also for the human. Because it makes, it's as if you... The stimulus changes. This, the stimulus control changes for you as well, shifting from "I'm not going to do anything that hurts you" or "I'm not going to do anything that's aversive to you right now" to "I am now in this different condition that is temporary, where I have to do things to you or force you to do things in a way that isn't really optimal, but I've given you warning and I have now stepped into this different role." So I think that's one of my most like practical, pragmatic advice that see, often seems to be helpful, regardless of who the person is and what training background they have. And then we can go from there, both into how can we do our best in the scenarios where there is no force needed, where we can just work cooperative care, uh, where we can just work with positive reinforcement through and through, and how can we do our best in the scenarios where some amo amount of force or coercion is needed to still make that as, li li as little stressful as possible. But for me, I find it helpful to sort of differentiate between these two. And by, and by, so by separate procedures, you mean that if we're working in a cooperative setting, that there are cues present to help you understand the learner help you dog, horse, exotic animal, the learner understand that you have choices in this setting uh, and you're in control of what happens. You can leave, you can say um, no to an, a cue that's being asked of you to, to rest your chin here, you can choose not to do that. Uh, and if you choose not to, we're not going to proceed. To so separate that into we're not going to offer those, those cues aren't going to be present here because actually this is going to happen. Um, and, and so changing as much as you can to help the animal understand that it's separate to the conditions where it has the choice and control. Is that, is that, is that fall into what you were saying? Or yeah, you I'd say that fall, falls into that of having something that is separate and it can be as simple as, um, when I was working agricultural high school and there were rabbits at the facility 
And usually there would be procedures where students would uh, go pick up a rabbit and get it into your lap and then do a health check. And then starting to go, okay, can we see if we can have um, rabbits voluntarily come into the into the crate or into your arms and onto your lap and eat while you do this health this health check. And then the assignment that they had for the lecture that wasn't my it wasn't my lesson. I was just there, there helping with them with some of the procedure. So the assignment still included you need to do a health check on this on this rabbit, whether the rabbit is in on that or not. And then how can we negotiate this? Okay, so one way we could do was just, okay, start with just offering treats, see if the rabbit joins you. If it doesn't and you decide that, okay, I now need to shift from asking you through giving you treats and see you you have freedom to avoid and change conditions into, I'm sorry, I will now grab you and put, me in, put you in my lap. Just add a two second or five second step away Take the treats away, step away, say out loud to yourself and to the rabbit, but mostly to yourself, now I have to. And then step forward and do, do whatever you're going to do, whatever that procedure looked like. Like any minimal break where you go verbalize to yourself, now I'm changing this, now, now this is what, what will happen. And whether that made a difference, like if it's the rabbit learning or if it's mostly the human learning i think in that scenario it was mostly the human because that meant that they could be through and through offer offer treats respect animal boundaries no trying to lure or coerce into more difficult scenarios than what the rabbit was doing because the student knew that if this doesn't work I'm just going to step away and I'm going to say I'm sorry I have to and then I'm going to get my rabbit so it protected the student like the human student from their own behavior of I have to get this done. So I think it's it's partly it is definitely separating the procedure for the animal, absolutely 100%. But it's also about separating the contingencies for the human. I have lots of questions, but we have limited time. So This is why I'm so happy that we're spending a lot of time in New Zealand later this year. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. We're going to have days yeah. to unpack this stuff. I'm I'm curious. Something else I wanted to talk to you about today is uh, we we just we recently had Hannah McGee on our show talking about assent, and we've talked about consent a lot. Uh, and so, for me, as recently as the end of last year, I started to think more about the word assent. Can you talk to the listeners about what role assent plays in cooperative care and how it is implemented? Oh, it's a good one. So I would sort of start bottom up and say, okay, so assent is a word that is used within some communities. How does that match some of the things that we're doing? Um, Rather than go, I want to work with assent or I want to work with consent. How can I do that? I would turn it around and say, okay, there is a word out there. Does that match some of the things that we're doing? Uh, and I can see that, yes, it does. So ascent is used, is a word that's used for the individual that cannot give legal legal consent. So legal consent is like a, a law enforced term that the, a small child or a non-human animal cannot do that legally. So then the word, the word ascent has developed. It has to do with, from a behavioral and contingency perspective, it mirrors when there is a predictable outcome of a behavior that we can interpret as saying yes or saying I agree. So what what does that mean? Well, that means that it is behavior that has a consequence history of uh, that that matches... (laughs) the outcome that you're going into now, which is the exact same thing as what, from from as far as I can see, the the contingency that we 
long time ago um, started talking about a start, a start button behaviors. It sort of it comes under the same umbrella. It it it's, it describes the same the same contingency where the the behavior that we label that somebody would label yes or I agree or assent giving consent giving assent giving um, behavior requires experience with the conditions that comes that comes next and so with cooperative care behaviors we are asking for consent if we for example say this is a question because i don't even know if, if i completely are skilled in articulating the difference between the two we're asking for consent if we ask for let's say our dog to come and offer a chin rest to do an ear clean. So come rest your chin here and I'm going to clean your ears. And then we ask... If that chin rest has previously, when it's been previously offered under similar conditions, you have been cleaning the ears. So the behaviour, the reinforcement history for the behaviour or the consequence history for the behaviour would include ear cleaning. I put my chin here and ear cleaning happens and treats happens. And then once the chin is rested, though, we don't stop asking for consent. So whether we call it like this, I find this so tricky to put 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 the words to put the words in there, because I'm like, I, I will jump all the way out to is it really is our time best spent figuring out whether what we do match the verbal criteria for the word assent or consent or not? Is that verbal matching our, in our absolute best interest? And I think reason for me going there, which might not, I, I don't know, that might be totally unhelpful, but I know that Emily and I, with our start button behaviors, have we have like been dodging the word consent constantly since it started showing up. It's like it's it's just it's behavior, all of it. It's behavior with reinforcement history, and just like request behaviors, I can like I do find it helpful to differentiate between request behaviors where the maintaining reinforcer is to get what matches the behavior. Like my dog can ask for water through pouring her water bowl and then she gets water. Um, She can bark outside the door for getting in. That's like one category that I find helpful to to just have like those are behaviors. It's still just behavior for reinforcement, but it's sort of a, a category of behavior that I find helpful. I also do find it helpful to have a category of behavior or a category of contingencies that are there is a predictable outcome of this behavior that includes some other events that are not the maintaining reinforcer, but they are part of the consequence package. They are part of what happens when you offer this behavior. And that is from my understanding of the how the word assent is used that that will be like um that 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 uh, there is a match there but whether that is whether this is something that we benefit from doing through and through in our cooperative care scenarios that is actually a different question so if we by assent mean we respond through stopping when we see behavior um, functioning to stop our hands, for example. Like if, if, the, if, if that is what we're looking for, if we stop, if, if we look at the word assent through the individual has the possibility to opt out, we do not continue if they opt out, then opting out would be behaving for the, the negative reinforcer of us stopping, stopping and us responding to that behavior. So that's like, that's one level. And I think that is is one that we generally want to stick with. 
But I do find, and this uh, this has really been one of my like big challenges personally, and maybe it is still, in working with cooperative care behaviors compared to working with trick training behaviors or uh, my agility behaviors or my obedience behaviors where I could build everything through and through just positive reinforcement and and escape escape the rest, so to speak. While in my cooperative care training, there will be a lot of scenarios where I will be working through and through positive reinforcement, completely predictable opt-in, opt-out behaviors, like left, right, center, and where I would say, I can build it so that the, my learner knows exactly what will happen at all time. But I also see that that is not always the most productive way to do everything in my cooperative care training. And I, because a part of it might also be teaching my animal to keep relaxed and keep breathing through a more difficult part of the procedure through something that is painful or uncomfortable at the moment. And for that to becoming a cue for relaxing in rather than tons up, for example. And I'm I'm just not sure, maybe I'm complicating things way too much now, but I'm just not sure that our super focus on do I have a scent, do I have opt-in for every tiny bit of every procedure is necessarily helpful. And then and then I'm like, if we're then try if we then work too hard to cram our corporate cooperative care training perfectly into these consent or assent labels, do we risk not doing the best training that we can? Maybe we should start the other way around and not worry too much about those labels. Rather start looking at what are which comes back to what I presented as my first big challenge in what are our behavioral goals? What outcomes are we looking for? What behaviors are we looking for? What behaviors are helpful for the animals? Which different procedures can we use? Just like relax from putting ourselves in ourselves into constricted boxes that are defined by words and labels. <laughs> just sort of shoulders down and let's go see what we can do with it with the training or what might be what might be most helpful yeah it's a really valued and interesting perspective it makes me think what comes first the, the chicken or the egg it's like thinking about those who might be brand new to training just learning about positive reinforcement training and they learn about the procedure which is cure behavior animal office behavior, then I give positive reinforcement. And then we've got trainers who have to um, understand what reinforcement means, then that it doesn't just mean food, and understand that the goal is to get the animal to reinforcement. So that reinforcement might be space, it might be proximity, uh, and that means that the animal doesn't necessarily want your food. But that's so hard to do for some people because... The textbook says cue, behavior, reinforcement. And so you have to learn to look for all of these things. But I think learning that textbook way can be challenging because it means that you miss a lot of things. And I think that's what you're saying here as well, is that we kind of learn from the textbook and we learn from Ryan's podcast and we learn from this, that, and the other, that there are these words and there are these things. And then without learning history ourselves, we have to go and implement that with our learners and so we're just trying to understand how we implement the terminology and the tools we use, which makes us miss the if-then moments in our training sessions and the back and forth moments. So how, how how do we then how do we how do we if we're new to this, do it the other way around? How do we how do we kind of like put the textbooks down? Not that I'm suggesting that you do that, but understand that the words are words and they have definitions. But to leave them at the door when we step in front of our trainer and to respond to what our trainer is doing in that moment. I mean, that's a hard thing to do. Is that question even making sense? It, uh, yeah, it is. It does make sense. And it is, uh, I totally agree. It is, a, it is a tricky thing to do. So maybe then for our current topic of cooperative care and the label of assent, 
maybe it would make sense to say, make it easy for the learner to opt out. If, if, if that is an easy way to say it, make it easy for the learner to opt out. And then if we can, if we can do that and then we can figure out the rest, if we can from that framework just go, okay, so how, how can I teach the behaviors that I would like to teach? How can I get relaxation? How can I get movement? How can I get coming toward me? How can I get uh, positioning yourself? How can I get uh, relaxation and uh, around all the equipment? How can I get my equipment and my hands moving and all of that become cues for behavior for positive reinforcement rather than um, motivations for avoidance. Like get at it from that end maybe. For me personally, it has been like super helpful to have the make it easy for you to opt out and then I have to do the rest. And if I can't let you opt out, if I cannot let you if, if I can't make it easy for you to opt out because I have to do something, then I just made it easy for myself and went, okay, then I'm going to have some kind of warning to differentiate it for me. And so that comes to, this, I'll share with you where my thoughts are and then bounce them off you and, and see what you throw back at me is that that comes back to the trainer um, and what their reinforcers are. So let's say that I'm, watching cooperative care on social media and I and I've learned about it from this podcast and this webinar and I'm gonna go implement it. Um, then my reinforcer, depending on how you as an individual human being and your your learning history with training and cooperative care or whatever area of training that you have spent the majority of your time in, your reinforcer might be I cue the behavior, I get the behavior and I offer the reinforcer. Well I get the behavior. If I get the behavior, I'm going to leave that session feeling good about myself. Yep. Right? I'm, I'm reinforced uh, and I want to do another session. Whilst if my animal's opting out, that might not match my expectations about what I wanted in terms of my training and I didn't get reinforced for doing that session just then. Even though your animal, yep. it was easy for them to opt out, which is what we want. My, the thing I wanted to make myself feel good about myself is the animal doing a chin rest or the animal offering the paw, or well, the animal put its head, head in the harness. So maybe it's about us. And ha- how do we how do we as, as trainers look at ourselves and, and, and understand what our reinforcers are and that the reinforcer is getting an animal to reinforcement and that doesn't always mean doing the behaviours that you ideally want the animal. Yeah, it's about building building reinforcers for ourselves and other humans, right? Like and and it goes it totally goes together with again this what what are the goals of the sessions when we look at animals what what are our criteria for successful training for ourselves uh, where listening to the like reinforcing tossing a few treats for the for the uh, the dog that backs away and go. Yes, I saw I saw that. Did you see? Did you see that I saw it? Did you see that he was pulling his ears back and I took my hands off and then I tossed a few treats over his head? Did you see? That was really cool, wasn't it? And did you see what he did next? Then he just relaxed his body again and he came over again. How cool is that? Like building building our reinforcement history and I think building social reinforcers within this uh, I think is is super important and super valuable and I I I'm pretty sure if I look at myself, like that, that bit required a bit of social reinforcement. It wasn't instantly reinforcing for me to listen to, to take my hands off or to stop. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, honestly, that's something I can still struggle with of really noticing and instantly moving away or, or stopping what I'm doing, even if that is within my training plan to do, it's in in what I am striving to do in that moment. It, there are still instances, especially if it's a situation with my own animals and where I'm in a like urgency mode, the stimulus control of that can still be a little bit weak sometimes. And I, and I, I think being around other people and having these conversations and and saying yay. Look, we see this. We see these uh, these behaviors, and we do this, and it's a good thing. And see what happens next is that our animals comes back to us again. 
because it's a delayed reinforcer, right? It, it might not be if my reinforcer is to get the nail trimmed or to get the collar onto the dog or get the dog into the car or feel this horse's hoof in my hand or get the rabbit onto my lap. If that is my reinforcer, then responding through backing up if my animal hesitates, that scenario of my animal now being further away from where my reinforcer is, like that needs to, that need, there, there needs to be built a reinforcement history for that because the actual reinforcer comes later. The actual reinforcer, uh, that will hopefully be my observation that this helps my training long-term. It gives me more relaxed behavior, which is why it's helpful to have relaxation and variation in behavior as part of my behavior goals, not just getting the nail trimmed or not just having the chin rest because I can then I can go, yay, I did this and now I see that variation in your behavior. I see that you're relaxing. I see that you're moving more freely. I see that you're breathing differently now that I took my hands off. So, so it comes, it actually does come together with the behavioral goals again, which will be reinforcing for me if I see behavior that matches what I'm looking for. And then if I look, I'm looking at more different things, then I will get access to more reinforcers also from the scenarios where I back up so that my, the reinforcers that my, behavior, that my animal is giving me through their behavior, like seeing, yay, I see behavior that I'm looking for. It's not just, yay, I see behavior I'm looking for. I get to do things, but also, yay, I see behavior I'm looking for. I see the relaxation. I see the body shift. I see all of that. I have so many questions, but no time to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> On this episode, I got plenty of time to ask them in November. I got days to ask them in November. Oh, um, my God. It, Ryan, you know that you are a little <laughs> bit at risk here, right? Because of, of. Uh, me just moving to New Zealand. <laughs> hey, man, I got a sleep out out the back. It's got your name on it. When are you coming? Are you going to move here in November or now? Come. <laughs> well, given the weather here right now, <laughs> I'm, I might. Well, you'll have to bring Anna and Shrag and, and your crew over with you so they can all stay here. Amazing. That brings us, unfortunately, everyone, to the end of today's conversation with Ava Bertelson. Your expertise and passion for cooperative care are inspiring. I'm sure our listeners have gained a wealth of new ideas from our discussion today. So thank you once again for joining us all the way from Sweden, not New Zealand yet. Before we wrap up, though, I want to extend a, extend a special invitation to everyone listening. If you're intrigued by what we've been talking about today and you're eager to learn more, or if you're just keen to stay updated on the latest in the world of animal training, we've got a fantastic opportunity coming up. For those of you in Australasia, don't miss out on the chance to attend the events in New Zealand and New South Wales, Australia. These workshops are going to be an incredible experience with Ava joining us. It's a rare opportunity to dive much, much deeper into the world of cooperative care with one of the leading figures in this field. So to find out more about these events, we'll be posting links on our Facebook pages. That is Animal Training Academy and Positive Behaviours for the New Zealand event and Canine Education Academy for the Australia slash New South Wales event. So you can find details for both the New Zealand and the New South Wales events there. Make sure to follow us on Facebook to get the latest updates and information. Additionally, we encourage everyone to join our email list so signing up for those newsletters is the best way to stay informed. Um, to join the Animal Training Academy list, head over to atamember.com. And for the Canine Education Academy, visit canineeducation.academy. So that's for ATA, that's A-T-A-M-E-M-B-E-R.com. And for the Canine Education Academy, that's C-A-N-I-N-E-E-D-U-E-R.com. C A T I O N dot Academy A C A D E M Y. Uh, so if you, we'll link to all of us in the show notes as well. Uh, and you can find the events on Facebook via the show notes or by heading to our Facebook pages. Finally, those finally though, Ava, for those who might want to learn more from you in the interim between now and the end of the year, where can they go to find out more about you, what you're up to, and get in touch? 
So you can find me at evabertelson.com and through the website you can also find the uh, the webshop with the webinars and other things and on Instagram it's eva.bertelson and you've set up a special URL for the listeners of this episode I believe I have so and it's it's already up and running so we did just did a page that is the URL is evabertelson.com slash ATA with uh, some bonus material for you guys. Cooperative Care bon- bonus material just for the listeners of this show. Wow. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, and head over to there, evabertelson.com slash ATA. We will link to that in the show notes as well. It's very kind, and it does officially bring us to the end of this episode. So, Ava, thank you so much again for taking the time to come and hang out with us at ATA. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you, ATA community. You are oh, you're absolutely amazing and such an inspiration. It's it's so cool to uh, be be involved in this community. Love it. And thank you as well so much for listening. This is your host, Ryan Cartledge, signing off from this episode of the Animal Training Academy podcast show. It's our hope today's conversation sparked inspiration and added some tools to your trainer's toolbox. Remember, every training challenge is an approximation towards becoming a better trainer. Embrace the rough patches, learn from them, and keep improving. And don't forget, the path to growing your skills and expanding your knowledge continues beyond this episode. Visit www.atamember.com to join our waitlist and be the first to know when our membership doors open again. There you'll find a supportive community of trainers just like you, working to make a positive difference in the lives of animals and humans alike. Until next time, keep honing your skills, stay resilient, and remember... Every interaction with an animal or human learner is your opportunity to create ripples. We're here cheering you on every step of the way. See you at the next episode.